Welcome to Inspired Sundays for the weekend of October 16th through the 18th. You know, this past week, we had our annual fall meeting. And while it was virtual, of course, the videos and the education were absolutely fantastic. And maybe one of my favorite parts of all was how much I love watching the Stories of Resilience videos. And I'll be honest that my eyes welled up with tears several times during that video. You know, I was so inspired to see our campuses fight COVID with such love and dedication and really so much sacrifice. And that's such a core aspect of our culture, servant leadership. In fact, right, one of our trilogy service standards says this, we allow our servant hearts to guide our actions. And I've seen that to be true every single day I've ever been to a campus. So I hope you enjoyed today's message about servant leadership from Dr. Stephen Crane. If you have your Bibles, Colossians chapter one, we're gonna turn the page on that that, that first chapter in Colossians. But uh, there's no shortage of books on leadership. If you were to kind of do a a Google search on uh, Barnes & Noble, or maybe you went and looked up on Amazon. Don't do it right now. We've got other things to do. But you'd find no shortage of books on Christian leadership. In fact, I just kind of glanced at my shelf in my office, and just some of the titles that I have there on on leadership, they they look like this. We've got um, Where Have All the Leaders Gone by Lee Iacocca. Remember, he's the one that turned Chrysler around. Or Thriving on Chaos, a great book by Tom Peters, or The Road Ahead by Bill Gates. Good to Great, a great book on leadership by Jim Collins. And I've got all kinds of other books by, by Maxwell or Wagner or Callahan, but I've got to tell you that I've, out of all the books in my library, the best one on leadership is right here. It's the Bible. And as we come to our passage today, we're going to find a passage on how to become an effective leader. Now, before you turn me out, Understand, I think God has called you to exactly that, to be a Christian leader. And we're going to learn in this passage secrets to success, how to become an influencer of people, and really how to become the kind of person God designed you to be. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me. For you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This passage, I, I think gives us, from the life of Paul, secrets to success, how to become an effective Christian minister. And I've got to stop and say, you're not going to read this in a a secular book about leadership. These are uniquely Christian principles. But I've also got to stop and say, these aren't just for those leaders among us. This is just not for the senior minister or for an elder. This is not for, for some Christian leader in that sense. These are for all people who want to be successful in their Christian life. These, are, these principles are for all people who want to learn how to reach maturity in Christ. And I hope that's you, right? To become everything that God wanted you to be. And the truth of the matter is, we all make decisions. We all lead. We all influence others in our own way. Well, these are principles to help us become even more effective for that. In fact, we're going to learn not just about leadership, we're going to talk about Christian leadership, and actually, we're going to turn leadership upside down, because we're going to learn about Christian servant leadership, about servants leading. I might even ask you this. Anybody here want to be great in God's kingdom? Yes? You know how that ends? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. This is going to talk about servant leadership. These are principles to be successful in your Christian life. And as we look at the life of Paul, one of the most successful leaders ever, we're going to find out those keys to success. And we find, first of all, that Christian leaders are willing to pay the price. And I want you to notice the language here. It's actually rather shocking. Paul says this, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. 
what? What's going on here? These uh, seem, well, at best a little awkward. At worst, these seem sacrilegious. What do you mean? Is Christ lacking something? How are Christ's afflictions lacking? Does Paul think somehow that he can fill up something that's lacking in Christ? Can someone add to the value of Christ's afflictions? Nobody can fill up what's already complete. What's Paul talking about here? I've got to stop and, and just remind you that this book so far, this book of Colossians, Paul has been reminding us of the sufficiency of Christ. You don't need Christ plus something else or Christ plus someone else. We realize he's been writing about the fact that Christ is sufficient. So that's certainly not in view that somehow Christ has not accomplished for us what needs to happen. That's what the book is about, that he's sufficient. But Paul is going to suggest to us that he can help extend the gospel message to other people. And that's what he's talking about. He can take that message of the sufficiency of Christ and pass that on to other people, to those who have not yet heard the gospel message. And so he can help complete the spreading of the gospel through affliction. And he says, I can help and I can join with Christ as I suffer affliction for the sake of the gospel. And I've got to stop and say, you want to talk about somebody suffering for the gospel's sake? Paul certainly did. Let me take you just one, to one passage in the book of Corinthians. Uh, we, we read these words, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received the hands of Jews, the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and dangers. And then he's going to list all kinds of dangers from rivers, from robbers. We're going to read as we go on from my own people, from Gentiles in the city and the wilderness at sea, from false brothers in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst. Off of that food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. See, so Paul's going to take the gospel message forward. And as he does, he does through that through great hardship and great pain and expense. He suffers for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. But you need to understand that's part of what makes Paul great. His willingness to take the gospel message forward no matter what. Through all these hardships and turmoils and struggles and pain, he is going to take the gospel message forward no matter what. And that's what makes him a great minister of the gospel message. That's what makes him a great leader to say, no matter what, I'm going to take the gospel message forward. What a contrast to many, especially in our day and age, who want to avoid suffering or hardship. You've seen that, right? Right? Uh, people that really, they don't, wanna, they don't wanna risk anything or they don't want any type of animosity. In fact, there are even some people, even in Christian circles, who, uh, who preach that suffering and hardship is a result of sin. I wanna stop and say, tell that to Paul. Actually, his hardship was because of his righteousness, not because of his sin. Paul, Paul suffered for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul never asked, how much will I get out of this? Or Paul never said, how can I get out of this? But Paul said, what can I put into it? He really looked around and said, what is it I need to do for the gospel message of Jesus Christ? And we read as we go through this passage that he suffered greatly and he suffered for the sake of the church to grow God's kingdom. And as we look through uh, this passage in Colossians, notice how he suffered. Notice Paul's suffering. Paul experiences overwhelming physical suffering. He, he experiences antagonism from outside the church, those people who are preaching against him. He has attacks from within the church. And most of all, his heart goes out for the people who are struggling. And I want to stop and just pause for a second and say, this is one of the things that make, makes Paul so successful. He was willing to do whatever it takes for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. No matter the consequences, no matter how much hurt, he was willing to pay the price to make sure the gospel message of Jesus Christ went forward. He has this whatever it takes mentality. And I want to suggest to you, God's looking for that kind of people. Let's say, whatever it takes, Lord, whatever you'd have me do, wherever you'd have me go, count me in. I want to do your will no matter what. In fact, the truth of the matter is, rather than trying to avoid suffering, Jesus told us we should expect that. He told his disciples in John chapter 15 exactly this. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, and they did, they'll also persecute you. And so a great leader is not one that's trying to cut corners or trying to make things easy. A great leader is actually the one that leads no matter what, no matter the consequences. And that's what it takes to be an effective Christian leader. 
pretty fun so far, right? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you're going to learn to be a servant, which means I'm willing, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, I'll do it. But he goes on. As we read about Paul's life, we see some other clues and some other secrets to success. We also realize that a servant leader needs to have this ministry mentality. He's willing to suffer. He suffers for the sake of his body. That is the church of which I became a minister. I suffer for the sake of the body, the church. It's interesting if you read through the letters of Paul. Paul kind of has a standard greeting. A lot of times he'll say, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. You recognize those words? Many of his books open that way. What's interesting is many times when he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, he uses the word doulos, which is actually the word slave. And so it might be better translated a slave of Christ Jesus. Now here he actually uses a word that's translated minister, but it actually would be better translated servant. Did that make any sense? The word that we normally translate servant might be better translated slave, and the word translated minister here might be better translated servant. It's the word from which we get our word deacon. You've heard of elders and deacons in a church? That word diakonos means a servant or a waiter or a helper of people, one who renders servants service. What's interesting is that is a word of putting other people first. That, that word deacon in our language, it's not a title. It really is not even a position, although we, we put it forth that way. It's not a position of authority. Actually, the person that's best qualified is the person that serves best. It's the one who serves people. And notice what Paul says. Paul says, I am a servant. I'm a servant of the body of Christ, of which I am a servant. I'm a, I, I work for the, 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 the good of the, 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 the church and the gospel message. And he's actually, by doing that, he's actually following the example of Jesus. Remember the story of Jesus in the upper room? He's going to establish the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. And as he comes in, he recognizes that nobody has washed the feet of others. So you remember what Jesus does? He takes out his outer garment he wraps a towel around his waist, and he starts washing the feet of the disciples. Remember that story? He's the one that became a servant. Or I love the, the, the verse, one of my favorite verses in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 10, 45, uses this word diakonos. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. There's our word twice in one verse. Not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. See, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you need to learn to be the servant of all. It's not about power. It's not about authority. It's not about a position. It's not about a title. The one who is most qualified is the one that serves best. I want to tell you, if you want to become effective in God's kingdom, that's what you need to do. You need to not only be willing to pay the price and say, whatever, Lord, but you need to have this ministry mentality that says, here's what I need to do. I need to learn how to serve other people. And you start thinking about what I've suggested so far about willing to pay the price and having this ministry mentality Contrast those words with a book you might read from the world's perspective. Con uh, contrast the world's words of leadership and Jesus' words. And if you read a book on worldly leadership, here's how the world views leadership. We'd hear words like power and influence, leverage, make things happen, no nonsense, no regrets. And really, the worldly leadership is like a pyramid with a leader on top and giving orders to everybody else below. I've got to stop and say, that is not Christian leadership. In fact, Christian leadership flips that triangle upside down. And actually, the one that leads best is the one that serves most. And if you talk about Christian leadership, those words are much different. Those are words like compassion and humility, gentleness, generosity, patience, servanthood. It's, it's bottom-up leadership. I'm serving other people. And actually, it's a leadership that calls people down to that level saying, won't you join with me as I serve others? And you need to realize that's what God's looking for. God's looking for people who say, God, whatever you want me to do, whatever you would, would have me be, that's what I want to do. God's looking for people who will invest in the lives of other people, no matter the hardship or the consequence. People that, uh, that will say, God, I want to become exactly what you want me to be. And that's what Paul is here. Paul's a servant of God, this diakonos. And notice, Paul is a servant of God. He's been commissioned by God. Uh, Paul is a servant of the church. He's going to give himself up to the church. He's a servant of God's word. And as I look at those things, a servant of God and a servant of the church and a servant of God's word, I've got to stop and say, that's exactly what I want to be. How about you? A servant of God, a servant of his church, and a servant of the word of God. See, Paul is actually having to stand up against some false teachers. 
And what he's doing is he's stopping and saying, no, let me tell you what a true leader looks like. Here's what a true leader is characterized by. And Paul's saying, I'm willing to give my all for the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and that's what he does. He's going to be a servant of God and of his church and God's word, which means he's not going to pick and choose which part of God's word he's going to preach. He's going to preach the word of God, and he's going to preach it to all people possible. That's what it means to be a leader, a Christian leader. What a contrast between the world's view of leadership and God's view of leadership. There's a great story that happened during the American Revolution. There's a corporal who has seen barking orders to soldiers. Now, these soldiers were rebuilding a barricade. You can imagine this, a, a corporal barking out orders to those who serve under him. Well, as he was barking out those orders, a man in civilian clothes rode past. He was on a horse, and he asked the corporal, why aren't you helping? And the corporal replied, because I'm the commander. Well, the man got up his horse and began helping the soldiers build the barricade. When the corporal asked the man his name, he said, my name is George Washington. I'm the commander-in-chief. You see, one man had a title, the other was a leader. And I want to suggest to you that's exactly what God is looking for. Looking for men and women who are saying, count me in, sign me up, whatever it takes, Lord. I want to help serve other people. But as we go on, we find out not only was Paul willing to pay the price, he was willing to suffer for the gospel, and he was willing to serve other people for the sake of the body of the church of which he was a minister. But a Christian servant leader also can see the big picture. And notice what Paul says here. He's talking about how he's leading. And he's saying, Christ, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He knew what his goal was. Here's what we're doing. We're proclaiming Christ. Here's what we're doing. We're warning everybody and we're teaching everyone and we're trying to present everyone complete, mature in Christ. He knew his mission statement, which by the way, Paul's mission statement was remarkably similar to our mission statement. Reach, teach, equip, and send. He was taking the gospel message and warning them and teaching them with all wisdom that he might present everyone complete. And so we realized that that's what Paul was doing. Paul knew his mission statement, and he evaluated everything by whether or not that mission statement was being accomplished. Here's what's interesting. We can read elsewhere that there were other, pre, uh, other people that were attacking Paul there were some people who were actually preaching the gospel out of false pretenses and making statements against Paul uh, that weren't true, and they were even preaching with impure motives. How'd you like that? But here's what Paul says about that, Philippians chapter 1. These people are attacking Paul and preaching out of false pretense. And he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. He could look around, even though people were attacking him, he realized they were preaching the gospel. And even, so, even though some people were preaching out of false motives, he could stop and say, it doesn't matter. Christ is still being proclaimed. See, he stopped and evaluated whether or not the mission was going forward. He saw the big picture, and he realized that if that was happening, things were good. Paul's goal of presenting everyone complete and mature in Christ. He wanted everyone to grow up, not just show up. I want to suggest to you, that's the attitude of a Christian servant leader. Realizing, what are we here for? What are we supposed to accomplish? This big picture. I like the words of Gordon MacDonald, just a reminder. There are many things the world can do as well as the church. Entertain, sing, counsel, draw crowds, build buildings. There's one thing the church can do the world cannot. We can extend grace. I could add to that that the Christian, the church, can share the gospel message. The Christian, uh, uh, Christian can share the gospel message of hope and of forgiveness. See, that was, that's what the church is about. We need to realize that it's not just about buildings and programs. It's about presenting people complete in Christ. That's what we're here to do. We're supposed to take the focus off ourselves, and we really need to change our attitude and say, whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, I'm going to serve other people to help reach people with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And that's what it takes to be great in God's kingdom. 
becoming the servant of all. Taking the focus off ourselves and placing it squarely on Christ. Actually, I think maybe in many churches a new approach is needed. See, we should be less concerned with what I get out of it. Can you imagine Paul saying that? What do I get out of this, Lord? We need to be less concerned with what I get out of it and more concerned with what I should put into it. We really need to have more patience and understanding. It's not about what I want. It's about what Christ wants. What's it going to take to reach the next generation for Christ? What's it going to take to take the gospel message forward? What would God have us do? We need to be less concerned with our rights and more concerned with our responsibilities. What is it that I can bring to the table? How would God have me act? How would God have me respond? And really, to hear less me, my, mine, and more reach, teach, equip, and send. So the church is about taking the gospel message forward. And what God is looking for is people to say, count me in. God, sign me up. Whatever it is you want me to do, however you'd have me respond, however you'd have me serve, whatever it is that you want to accomplish in my life, that's what I want, Lord. And it's this leadership upside down. It's this servant leadership that Paul expresses here. How did Paul do it? I'm going to stop and say there's one more lesson, really one more secret to success and that's that Paul knew the strength or the source of his strength. And Christian servant leaders know the source of their strength. Notice the language here. For this I toil. How do you like that word? For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. It's interesting. He uses some words we don't like much. We understand that word toil, and we probably don't like it much. He uses another word, struggling. Now, that, str- that word struggling is an interesting one because literally it's the word from which we get our word agony from. We could say agonizing. It's a word that means to become tired, but not just physically tired. It's a word that literally means to be mentally, physically, and emotionally tired. And so Paul says, I've been toiling and struggling. He's been agonizing for the gospel message. Paul knew what it was like to work hard. And what's interesting is read Paul's writings. He not only worked hard, but Paul loved others who worked, worked hard beside him. Notice just a, a few examples about Paul working hard or others working hard. First Corinthians, I worked harder than all of them. Or the end of Romans, greet Mary who worked hard for you. Or again, in that same list, greet those workers in the Lord who have worked hard. Or First Thessalonians, respect those who labor among you. Again, I've got to suggest there are a lot of people that are trying to take the easy way out. There are a lot of people saying, what's in it for me? There are a lot of people saying, well, here's what I want. That's not what God's looking for. God is looking for servants. God is looking for people to take the gospel message forward. Those people who will struggle and labor for, on behalf of him for the sake of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. God is looking for people who are saying, use me, Lord, however you will, wherever you will, and I'm going to serve you with all my might. You know, if I look around the world around me, I bet you'll agree with me. I think in the world around us, there's a crisis in work ethic in our culture. Anybody believe that? You look around, and we're teaching the next generation to really have this attitude What's in it for me? We're raising up an entitlement generation. We we have people that really, well, these are my rights, and here's what I'm going to demand from you as if life is supposed to be served them on a silver platter. I think we're doing the next generation a disservice. I think we're actually doing a disservice in our country as well, but it's not just the country. It's not just the the next generation. We also do this in church We've become a consumeristic church. What's in it for me? I don't like this. Rather than saying, what should I put into it? And we see Paul painting a different picture. Willing to pay the price and a servant mentality, ministry mentality, saying, what is it you'd have me do? Well, how did Paul do that? Paul says he's laboring and struggling. But I want to suggest to you he didn't do that in his own strength. How'd Paul do it? Well, look at verse 29 again. For this I toil struggling with all his energy that powerfully works within me. Paul's actually not doing this in his own strength. He's relying on God. Okay, God, count me in, but I need some help here. 
Okay, God, whatever it is you want me to do, but I'm relying on you to help strengthen me and encourage me and guide me and, and, and lead me. And so, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but work in me. It's not in his own effort, but it's in, in Christ's strength. It's in Christ's energy. I love the saying that says, we must remember that the best of men are men at best. What God is looking for is people saying, okay, Jesus, I'll follow, but I need some help. With God's help, we can accomplish great things. We need God's help, and I believe we are often too self-sufficient. We try to do things on our own rather than relying on a great God who wants to strengthen us and encourage us and enable us to accomplish what he would have us do. How do we proceed? Well, Paul says it well elsewhere. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So God is looking not only for people who are willing to say, okay, take me and show me and use me, but God is also looking for people who will allow God to work in them and through them. And so as we read down through this passage, we realize what made Paul great. And what we need to do is we need to adopt some of these principles. And our goal should be like his goal to be mature in Christ and present people mature in Christ Jesus. And so what we need are some people saying, count me in, sign me up. I want to be a servant leader, a Christian servant leader. And I've got to tell you, what God's looking for is completely different than what the world is asking for. Two, different, two totally different approaches to leadership. If you look at the, the world's approach to leadership, there are differences in style. The, the differences are like this. The world Christian leadership, one leads, by, one leads by dictate and power. The other by serving. One emphasizes profit, the other people. One says only the strong survive. The other says the strong have the most to give. One, set, one spotlights personal rights. The other personal responsibility. One resorts to intimidation and power. The other works through love. Completely different. But I want to suggest to you that God is looking for men and women to be leaders. But I need to change that language. Actually, God is looking for people to be servants. You see, it's not just about leadership. It's about everyday life. Because every day, you are called to make decisions. No matter who you are. You've got decisions to be made. How are you going to spend your time? How are you going to spend your resources? What are you going to do? And God is looking for people who, says, who will say this, God, whatever it takes, whatever it costs, whatever you want, Lord, count me in. God is looking for people who are willing to pay the price, who are willing to have the servant mentality, people who are looking to say, God, what would you have me do? And they can see the big picture, and they will rely on him and say, God, count me in. God is looking for servants to take the gospel message forward. God is looking for people who will invest in his kingdom, the church, and saying, God, use me. God is looking for those kind of people. God is willing to work through those kind of people. The question is, will you be one of those people? Christian servant leadership that says, Lord, Whatever it takes, use me. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to come before you. Father, we realize that what you're looking for is much different from what the world looks for, what the world requires. We realize what you, you want from us is this all-in mentality saying, Lord, use me for your glory. And so, Father, I, I just want to stop and say, count me in, sign me up. I want to be a servant. I want to be a servant of you and a servant of your church and a person who's, who, who serves using the word of God. And my prayer is that we'll be a church full of those kind of people, a church full of servants, Christian servant leadership, because we realize in order to be great in your kingdom, we must be the servant of all. Father, we realize that even your son did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And so help us serve you. And that's our prayer. We pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much to Dr. Stephen Crane for this wonderful and timely message on servant leadership. And in the same spirit, here's my prayer for us this week. Lord, I pray that our eyes are open to the needs of others, no matter how 
large or small, and that we offer ourselves to them. We pass on resources that exist for their well-being, and we find ways to serve them that ultimately glorify you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a very blessed week serving those around us. Thank you.